My name is Chris Poffren from Utrecht University, and this clip gives you an introduction to psychophysics. These are the learning goals. I'm going to talk about what psychophysics is in general, and what the psychophysical threshold is. I'm also going to describe two important psychophysical tasks, the detection and discrimination task. I'm going to talk about the psychometric function. You will also learn about two methods that get at the psychophysical threshold the method of limits and the method of constant stimuli. I will also discuss two important concepts, hysteresis and bias. First, what is psychophysics? I have an official definition. Psychophysics is the quantitative study of how people or animals detect, resolve, discriminate, identify, categorize or describe defined stimuli. To put this in simple words, Psychophysics is about the relation between physical stimulation and perception. At the center of psychophysics is the psychophysical threshold. What is it? To put it simply, it is about noticing things. For example, when is something visible? Look at the example below. We're going to detect the stimulus. I will gradually increase the intensity of a pattern. At some intensity, you can see it. Let's go. Start at the fixation dot, please. Now I see it. What about you? The intensity at which you start seeing it is the threshold. We can also do vice versa. The intensity at which the stimulus becomes invisible. Here we go. Look at the fixation dot on the right. Now it's gone. So what is a threshold? The psychophysical threshold is just simply the intensity at which the stimulus became visible or the intensity at which the stimulus became invisible. It's around, it's about this transition from visible or invisible or vice versa. One way of getting at the threshold is the detection task. Let me introduce this with an example. Imagine you are employed in an M&M factory. You stand at the conveyor belt. Your job is to detect bad M&Ms, as the one on the right. It's a little bit fainter than the red one. When you detect it, you remove it. The, mel the belt moves fast, so I'm going to mimic this by showing it display briefly. Can you detect a bad M&M? An M&M &M being fainter, here we go. Clearly, that was a bad one. So in this task, and in any detection task, you say yes when you detect it, and no when you don't. So I'm going to do a couple of trials with you. Here we go. No. Again, no. No. Yes, I saw it. Top left, what about you? Bottom right, yes, yes. Let me show you what I just did with the displays. I increased the intensity, in this case, the faintness of the M&Ms, from trial to trial. This is the classic approach. It's also called the method of limits. So in the classic approach, you increase or decrease the intensity from trial to trial. In the method of limits, you gradually increase the intensity of something you are detecting, or you get gradually de decrease the intensity. When you increase the intensity, you stop at the point at which the subject can detect the stimulus. These are called ascending series. The point at which you stop is the threshold. When you decrease the intensity, you stop at the point where you can no longer detect the stimulus. These are called descending series. Again, the point at which you stop is the threshold. Something that typically happens in the method of limits is that the threshold depends on whether you gradually increase or decrease the intensity. This is called hysteresis and it is unwanted. It is unwanted because we do not know which of the two represents the true, true threshold. 
There is, however, a way to get around this. Instead of gradually increasing or decreasing the intensity from trial to trial, we simply change the intensity randomly from trial to trial. Now a subject cannot make an expectation of what the next trial will be like. This method is called the method of constant stimuli. Now imagine we have done an experiment where we change the intensity randomly from trial to trial. What will the results of a subject look like? In this graph, we plot the intensity on the x-axis and the detection performance on the y-axis. What you see is what you just experience. When the intensity is small, the M&Ms being just a little bit faint, you cannot detect them. When the intensity becomes larger, you can detect them. In addition, we can draw a line through the points. This is the psychometric function. It describes detection performance. Now we can also look at the threshold. First, we have the area below the threshold. Here you cannot detect. There's also an area above the threshold. Here you can detect easily. In the area where we see the transition, we pick our threshold the intensity at which the stimulus could be detected. There is, however, an important downside to a detection task. Let me explain. Imagine you work in this factory. If you don't perform well, you will be fired. Now imagine your supervisor says, you missed too many bad ones. In the experiment, this means you, you respond no too often. Your supervisor wants more yes responses. What will happen to your threshold? What you will probably do is, your, is that you change your response, especially, especially when you are in doubt. In this situation, your supervisor wants you to detect more. He wants you to say yes more often. This is what this will probably do with your performance. Remember, you respond yes more often especially when you are uncertain. The curve will move to the left. Take a minute to think about this. <laughs> the opposite can also happen. Your supervisor wants you to detect less, since you also detect good ones. Now the curve will move to the right. Again, take a moment and try to understand this. Now after these examples, do you think someone's threshold actually changed? Would you believe your bad M&M &M neurons suddenly got better? No, you would be suffering from response bias. You simply change the way you respond when you are in doubt. There is a solution for response bias, however. This is the discrimination task. In this task, you simply say which of two options contains the stimulus. Again, let me give you some examples. Now, tell me whether the bad M&M is on the left on the or on the right. Importantly, whether it's on the left or right is randomly varied from trial to trial. Here we go. Clearly left. I don't know. Now, here what's important in a discrimination task. You are forced to give a uh, response. So even if you don't know, you have to choose left or right. In this case, let me just guess because I don't know. Right. No idea. Left. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I saw something on the right. Left. Right. Right. The psychometric function will probably look like this. We can again get it as a threshold. When the intensity is low, it is difficult to say which of the two contains the bad M&M. When the intensity is high, it will be easy. 
Again, the threshold will lay somewhere in between. Notice, however, that the curve changed. This is because we now look at performance. You are either correct or not. Since there were two options to choose from, the chance level is 50%. Importantly now, response bias hardly affects the threshold. There's no question of detecting too few or too many. You're not doing a detection task. Of course, you can be in doubt. But when this is the case, you can only guess whether the stimulus on the left or on the right. The curve will not move. If you don't entirely understand this, just remember, response bias hardly affects the threshold as you determine it with a discrimination task. To end this clip, let's return to our learning goals. I hope you learned about psychophysics, the psychophysical threshold, about detection and discrimination tasks, about the sacromatic function, the method of limits, the method of constant stimuli, hysteresis, and bias. Thank you for listening.